throughout uh, the workshop. And I kindly ask you to uh, use the chat function for that uh, because uh, then I will make sure that the questions are addressed to the speakers. And so we can sort of uh, put the remaining questions and the discussion for the last half hour of the, the workshop. So um, when that is said, I will continue to my next point, which is about a little bit facts about the DigiFresh project. And this project is an innovation project. It is running, it started in April this year and it will end by end of February next year. So it's a, a very short project that builds on a, a, a lot of knowledge that are already out there, but bringing it to the next step. It is, uh, we have four partners in the project. And I'll just put this one on. And uh, um, we have a partner from KU Leuven. Uh, and we also, there's a partner from Aarhus University, the coordinator, then we have a partner by Osul from Spain, and then we also have a partner, uh, uh, Exens from, from Israel. So we are fairly small project consortium group working very focusing, focused on the digital, um, to develop digital solutions for, for better prediction of shelf life of fresh fruit and vegetables. We are co-funded by the ERT Food and the European Union, and the project builds on competences from academia and industry on post harvest storage, quality assessment, shelf life modeling, digitalization, food waste reduction, and communication and dissemination. So what is the ambition about the DigiFresh project? It is to try and integrate existing commercial sensor technology and real-time monitoring. In this case, we have been focusing on temperature and relative humidity. So we, we try to uh, integrate those measurements, those monitorings with smart digital twins in order to be able to translate storage conditions in the supply chain into remaining shelf life. As you all know, there's a huge food waste with fresh fruit and vegetable. And that I'm showing in this slide. And that's one of the reasons why we really do need to do things smarter than we do today, because the food waste um, is very, very high. This is showing the, the waste of food in along the supply chain from the production to the consumption. And um, regarding waste of fruit and vegetables, it's 75% it's at primary production. Many, it's difficult to do any, for us, we cannot do anything about that waste, or at least when it comes to, for example, wrong quality at harvest, we cannot. But we can, what we can do, we can, with our solution, we could work uh, with, um, for example, storage at the farm level. So that's a way where you could reduce waste. Then there's also huge waste of fruits, in this case, at processing and manufacturing. And here, vegetables, it's 13% of the whole um, waste, which is 6.6 .6 metric tons, 5% uh, of the total waste in distribution and retail. And then at consumption, there's a huge waste. 41% of fruit and vegetables of uh, the total waste is uh, accounted uh, um, 41% of the total waste is uh, for fruit and vegetables. And why is it so? Yeah, that's because when it comes to um, um, Yeah, I just have to continue. When it comes to um, waste, we waste far too much uh, fruit and vegetables along the supply chain because the quality change without us noticing it. So it comes slowly, slowly, and at the end, the waste is very high. And why do we have waste? It's because the quality change. And why does the quality change? 
it's because fresh fruit and vegetables are live products and the quality of the products uh, change in response to the starch conditions. Here you can see strawberries, which we've been working with. And if the relative humidity is too low, we have desiccation. Or if the temperature is too high, the strawberries will very soon rot. Or if the time is very long at low temperature in air, we will also have decay of the strawberries, which you can see here. And this picture actually shows uh, how the, the quality of strawberries are, are preserved if we have a very low temperature but use controlled atmosphere. So these are um, some of the uh, reasons for uh, having the high waste of fruit and vegetables. And how can the Diggy Fresh solution then uh, help reducing the waste? Yeah, as you can see here, this is from one of our, uh, we did some trials during the summer with strawberries. We, we looked into three different weeks and these are, these are the temperature curves during the three weeks that we, uh, we uh, had a supply of strawberries. And you can see the temperature is varying quite a lot. And what the question is, what does these differences in temperature um, means regarding the shelf life of the product? And that's, that's really what a Digifresh is about. It is trying to predict what is the remaining shelf life that a fresh produce have after it has been uh, transported in the chain from A to B. Here you can see the various steps that the produce are running through during during the, the supply. So the aim of the Diggy Fresh solution will be to provide facts about the journey that the, the produce has been through and try to or, and translate those facts into remaining shelf life. And that's what we are gonna hear more about now. So with this introduction, I will start introducing on next speaker, and um, that is Alexander Luca, the coordinator of DigiFresh, and he will talk about digitalization of the supply chain of fruit and vegetables. And Alexander Luca, he uh, um, has a, a master's degree from, from Turkey um, in, uh, in uh, food uh, technology and um, or in food engineering. Uh, from Middle East uh, University in Turkey from uh, 2012, and a PhD from Aarhus University from 2015, where he worked with volatile organic compounds to as markers for quality change of fresh produce. Since then, he has been working in the industry. He has been working with mass container industries. He has also been a um, um, postdoc. And, and research scientist uh, at various projects at Aarhus University, working with the supply chain. And, um, and uh, at the moment he is uh, leading, um, he's coordinating this uh, DigiFresh project. So uh, with this said, I will stop my sharing and I will hand over to Alexander Luca uh, to uh, continue with his presentation. Okay, while we are waiting for Alex, uh, I remember if you have questions, please address them in the chat and I'll give them to him later on. So welcome, Alex. Hello. Thank you, Mareta. I just have to do some arrangements as I'm the host of this uh, workshop on yeah on zoom so there are too many windows open right now uh, yeah um, i'll make around 20 minute presentation and then there will be some time for question and discussion uh, and the presentation is about digitalization of the supply chain of uh, fruits and vegetables where the first part i will try to give an overview of all digital solutions that are available uh, currently in the fresh produce supply chain, and then uh, talk about some challenges uh, of 
uh, yeah, implementing digital solutions. Uh, okay. So to start with, I'd like to start with an overview of a supply chain and many of you know, it's uh, very difficult to actually show a diagram of a supply chain because it changed from one product to another. Uh, but let's imagine that this is a supply chain uh, that we will call like a regular supply chain, which starts with the grower from where the produce is moved to a packer, packaging company and then through exporter, it's put on some, in some containers or trailers and <clears throat> it's uh, then handed to an importer that moves it to a distribution center from where it can maybe go to a repackaging and finally it goes into retail. Yeah, and we can also have a short supply chain uh, like grower to packer or like the grower can pack the produce himself and then just transport it directly into retail. And like this is, this would be something ideal, but this is not the reality. There are so many different actors in the supply chain. And now when um, showing different digital solutions, I'll try to, I try to group them based on uh, who is benefiting or who is using these solutions. So for instance, you have some digital solutions that are used by uh, packaging companies and by the growers. And that's something they do at harvesting and while handling the produce. And this, um, of course, it also, there are also digital solutions for growing the produce, but we're not gonna talk about them. Uh, there are also solutions for harvesting, like uh, some models considering the um, uh, climate conditions and that uh, given as output an optimal harvest time. Um, there are um, quite some machines and like if you go to uh, fruit logistica and you, you have huge area with exhibition of at least in the past, let's say uh, we had like huge area with a lot of different kinds of sorting machines that can sort uh, produce based on uh, size, color, shape, some uh, defects. Uh, so it will pick only a product that is acceptable. And uh, there is a lot of digital background there. Uh, there is also something about packaging and labeling. Uh, I mean, we don't get a handwritten packages uh, they are all done automatically. So the packaging company just enters the relevant information in and then the labels are printed. Uh, here you can see like example of two labels from uh, some nectarines and apples that I bought in Denmark. And uh, you can see what type of information we are given. Normally we are given um, um, the cultivar name like red gold or um, crisp pink. And then uh, we are shown the country from where this produce originates from. So nectarines came from Greece and uh, apples from Chile. We have something about their class. So they were both class one produce. In this case, it writes that there are eight apples in a, in a package. And in this case, it's one kilogram of nectarines. Their size or caliber uh, what's very important, their lot number, so it was here, L, and here lot number, um, packaging company and uh, address of the grower in case of nectarines, and here uh, information of company who it was packaging, the end company that imported uh, these apples, and then we also have some barcodes. So there is actually quite a lot, if it does seem just a piece of uh, paper, but there is actually a lot of digital, uh, there are a lot of digital tools that are actually used in here. Yeah. Uh, next, <clears throat> I would like to talk about some tools that could be used, sorry, for business. Uh, yeah, and then normally everybody will be using those tools in the, supply chain 
And it is a little bit out of scope of this presentation because management of supply chain and uh, the solutions related to ordering uh, or booking things, uh, custom related uh, documentation, that is, this is a little bit out of scope of this uh, uh, um, workshop. So this is uh, a very generic slide, uh, therefore. So there are, if we talk about solutions for business, they uh, there are, companies can make quotations and orders online, uh, book transportation uh, and track their goods, uh, keep the documents in one place, integrate their the, the data coming from different platforms in their own platform. And uh, when it comes to commercial products, yeah, there are many different products. I just picked some uh, that are related to shipping, for instance, have supply chain management done by Maersk or my SIVA or my MSC and there are really more. And you can, you can find information by following these links. I also uh, found some other uh, digital solution that I thought was interesting uh, and that's called Ever Calculator. It's something that can uh, help you estimating carbon footprint for transporting, let's say in this case, one ton of fresh produce, or it can be anything, can be one ton of metal, uh, from Guayaquil to Hamburg uh, by air and by sea. Here you can see like how much CO2 is produced and that it's like a factor of almost 100, the difference in the carbon footprint. Um, but actually this calculator allows you to uh, add several transportation um, steps and then calculate the total carbon footprint. So it's quite useful and could be yeah, used by different companies. Um, next, I would like to move to digital solutions uh, that are used in transportation and cold storage. I think those of you who are working with Apple most probably said, yeah, but this doesn't look like a supply chain for apples because normally they will be stored after harvest and I don't have storage here, but yeah, it was, uh, but if you would talk about bananas, they're not stored and they're just transported. So I just chose the one where things are just transported immediately. But here uh, the solutions are very similar for both transportation and for cold storage. Uh, first, you hear with this first sentence, we have a lot of and ors and a lot of different options. It's because actually we don't have like one unique solution that does everything, like controls everything and monitors everything. That's why there are solutions that are either controlling some parameters or they are uh, monitoring them. And those that are important for fruits and vegetables, of course, the temperature, relative humidity, gas composition, uh, ethylene concentration, and in some case, acceleration could also be very important and it can lead to high weight, uh, waste if uh, produce is not handled properly. Besides that, uh, especially for transportation, uh, GPS tracking is uh, a relevant solution available on many platforms. Uh, users can uh, set up thresholds like minimum, maximum values that are acceptable and then they can be warned or there might be some alarms if uh, something goes out of the settings. Uh, they they uh, have a chance to import the data and then they have also some, yeah, a lot of other information like uh, there are solutions where they can know when <clears throat> when it's estimated that the goods will be delivered. Or sometimes they want to know on which vessel or on which truck uh, they are. And like door openers, if the door was open during the transportation, you can also get this information. Some commercial products, uh, yeah. With, if we talk about uh, container and shipping, um, it's Captain Peter. It's a good example of, um, of a digital solution for monitoring different conditions uh, and GPS tracking of the goods that are transported by the sea. 
Uh, when it comes to cold storage, uh, BatNet Win could uh, also be a good example. It's um, a technology a solution that can be used to both control and monitor uh, many different parameters in the cold storage room as well as in the ripening rooms. And then, uh, yeah, we have XSense, which is slightly different from both Captain Peter and BatNet Win. But this is not like this is not that only these three. Uh, products are available. There are many, many other project products. I just couldn't include all of them. And you, of course, can find information about these products if you follow the links. Uh, and you will we'll hear more about Xsense later today. So I won't uh, focus much on it now. And uh, this is the end of uh, this uh, yeah, description of digital solutions that are available. Um, right now, and we'd like to move to the next part, which is some challenges and challenges in perspective of digital solutions. And one of them is related to traceability and another is to shelf life monitoring. Well, with the traceability, especially with digital traceability, um, there are several important challenges. And one of them is how can we monitor uh, food waste from farm to fork, because we know that supermarkets can monitor waste in the supermarkets. But what does actually happen after the um, yeah, the fresh produce is bought and brought home? Uh, how can we involve consumers? And uh, actually, in Denmark, we do have. Um, it's not exactly a solution for this, but uh, selling group is doing something interesting. They have the they have introduced this freshness guarantee, and this is the Danish name. You can see, uh, you can see here the Danish name. And so, if, for example, in an advertisement, it's an avocado uh, that is bought by a consumer, <clears throat> and then they say, if you come once you come home and you cut open it, and see that it's bad inside, you just take a photo, send it to us, and we will give you money back. So that's the guarantee. As well, it's uh, if you bought, but you didn't look carefully when you were buying and you have something rotten inside, something bad, you can just send a photo and get your money back. So there could be something like this that consumers could be involved and they could share information with the supermarkets. If um, thinking that you have different growers supplying strawberries and one has very good growing practice, another has not so good growing practice, uh, but supermarket is not able to see a difference in the in the waste. So they both stay okay. Uh, the strawberries from both growers stay okay in the supermarket, but they actually uh, do create a big difference in waste when it comes to consumers. Uh, we may we may not see it, and actually even the growers may not see it. They might not know what type of uh, microorganism is causing this waste. So. That there is something here, and uh, another um, another hot topic uh, is, of course, and very related to environment and the carbon footprint. Uh, consumers, right now, at least in Denmark and most probably in majority of European Union countries, are not able to find information on what's the carbon footprint of the uh, bag of salad or uh, a bag of fruits they are buying. And this is, uh, uh, it could be uh, actually useful uh, and also could be something that could lead to reduction in CO2 if consumers knew the carbon footprint. Um, but uh, yeah. And then there's also another thing which is related to information that consumers provided. If once you like, if you remember those labels that I've shown, that's the all information consumer knows. So doesn't they do not know how how they were how those apples were grown, like coming from Chile, how did they arrive to Denmark? What were they treated with? What about the packaging? So this information is lacking. And again with digital solutions it's possible to bring this information to the consumer. And uh, another challenge that I want to focus on is related to shelf life monitoring. Um, 
first, why do we want to 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 monitor the shelf life? Is it important? Well, we will see now when we compare two management concepts, and there will be also a second question: how to determine shelf life of fresh fruits and vegetables? But let's first see why shelf life is important. So consider we have here three trailers that arrived one on Monday, one yesterday, and one arrives today. And uh, if we don't know their best before, so they, let's say they have strawberries coming from Spain to Denmark, just as an example. And then uh, with the concept of first in, first out, those <clears throat> strawberries will be sent to supermarkets based on when they arrived. So the batch one, as it arrived first, will be sold first, then batch two will be sold, then batch three will be sold. Then there is another way to do this. It's by focusing on what's the shelf life of those strawberries and until when they are okay, where until when they can retain their uh, quality. And that concept is called first expired, first out. So if we then uh, make a decision or a supermarket, make us a decision on when to sell and how to sell the strawberries, then they first need to sell batch two as it has uh, six days uh, shelf life. This also has six days shelf life batch three, but it arrived later so they can even combine two different concepts. Yes, so the same shelf life. But the batch one actually was quite good strawberry and was transported at optimal condition, let's say it's one degree, with under humid environment, so it's almost like fresh. Uh, and it has a shelf life of nine days, uh, so they could actually keep it and sell it later. Or they know the supermarkets they are selling it in, and then they know that in some of them they have good conditions for uh, selling the produce. Yeah, they have colder uh, temperature, it's colder in the, in, in the supermarket. So they could choose to send these strawberries in there that have shorter shelf life and to those where the temperature is very high and uh, there is high chance that they might spoil, they, would, they could send these that have longer shelf life, so better quality. Um, the very last two slides are, um, just a sec, um, are as, a small summary of this very nice paper that is uh, on digital twins and um, it's own open access paper so you can um, uh, following this link uh, go and download and read it and as i suggest you if you join this workshop and want to learn more about digital solutions i suggest you that uh, you read this uh, paper and uh, this uh, it, it describes yeah, digital twins and almost all the background about the digital twins. Uh, what I liked there was um, but the information that I thought was interesting was that uh, we, uh, the way we know digital twins, but they also have all other, other names like digital shadow, digital mirror, virtual avatar, or virtual phantom, or even synchronized virtual prototypes so when you hear those things you you can uh, think okay this is just a digital twin and by definition there are different definitions in this paper i took the most generic one um, it's a, a digital representation of a real product and it contains all kinds of information about proper properties and characteristics of the product as well as its geomet geometrical components. Um, it, is, it simulates accurately <clears throat> all the relevant processes and reactions um, throughout the life cycle of the product. And it uses and as an input uh, real data from sensors and it's preferred that the sensor is continuous and uh, real time. So it's an advantage in this case. Uh, and one that this, this is the last slide about digital twins. Um, 
you will hear more now in the next presentation by Martin uh, about modeling and prediction of shelf life. Uh, but uh, here I would like to highlight that there are different types of twins. So uh, there is a statistical twin, which is based on using empirical models and solving some simple or ordinary differential equations. Then there is a mechanistic approach or a physical approach, like computational fluid dynamics, for instance, could be considered here, and it's called mechanistic twin. And then it's uh, all kind of artificial intelligence, machine learning that's called intelligent twin. And um, yeah, I would like to stop here. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, for a very nice presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, press them to Alex. Um, we have time for questions. We have another uh, 10 minutes. Um, so while we are waiting, Alex, I would like to ask you, um, now we are focusing on temperature and relative humidity. Uh, what other environmental um, factors could you foresee would be interesting to uh, continue with if this um, digital solution is a um, um, if this digital solution is a success? Initial quality. Um... So the status, knowing the status of produce at harvest could also be um, something relevant. And uh, besides that, like also in, as written in this paper, uh, following gases, re gases related to respiration or uh, metabolism like oxygen and carbon dioxide, uh, following respiration, uh, ethylene, that could also give uh, additional um, knowledge, additional information in, uh, in the digital twin and make it more accurate. It's more about accuracy, but the thing is it's uh, not, implemented yet, or at least we don't know any, any product that has implemented digital twins for fruits and vegetables compared to other industries. Mm. So we need to start from something. And of course, that's temperature and humidity. That's the two most important. Yeah. I have here a question from Ken West. And he is asking, what are the key input parameters which you will include in the digital twin? And where will you get this data from to initially create the digital twin? Yeah, going back to... So for, uh, for a digital twin to operate properly and to give nice outputs, we need first sensor technology, uh, devices able to transmit this uh, data into some databases. Then uh, we need to store this data properly somewhere like in clouds or in blockchain. And then there is a computing step which uh, it can then, it, the, the calculations can be done either on cloud or in some servers. That's, yeah. Sorry, I don't know exactly the word, how it's <laughs> called the, when it's done on a computer. Uh, yes, and the major inputs in this case would be those that are collected by the sensor. And in this case, it's uh, temperature, humidity, time. Uh, time, we should not forget, because we need to know exactly the time when we start. And uh, yeah, the major outputs will be all kinds of description of all kinds of predicted um, 
quality attributes and shelf life. Yeah, I hope I answer. Okay, uh, there's another question coming up here, Alex. Is and this is from. Uh, okay, yeah, Pramut Mahatyan. Um, he's asking, are there any commercial applications of digital twins in the supply chain of fresh produce? Well, not not to my knowledge and not to the knowledge of the authors of this uh, review article. Uh, it's called quasi state right now. So it's not available at the moment for fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables. When it comes to healthcare or aerospace and it, there are solutions there. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. It seems like with this good space between the presentations, questions are arising. Um, first of I can say that uh, Ken West again, he asked, so you will base the digital twins primarily on temperature and humidity measurements by Xsense devices? And I can answer that for you, Alex. That's what we are doing at the beginning at, here at the first step of the of the or at the project at the moment. We will hear more about that. Then there's one question from uh, from Leo Lucas. He's uh, asking uh, how can digital twins benefit from uh, info available in existing track and chain systems. So if I understand correct, you mean the information that is already collected in track and trace, how it can be converted into the digital twin? Yeah, so how how the, yeah it's not that the digital twin benefits. Uh, yeah, I, I understand. But I don't know what type of inputs are available from track and trace. Um, so it's difficult to answer. And here, like, do you allow me to speak, Alex? Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I am also working on a digital twin project and yeah, I'm maybe. struggling with this question. And your answer is my answer. Indeed, what info is available exactly? But I actually think there is quite a bit of information stored, like where did it come from? When was it harvested? That kind of information. I think there is quite a lot of information available there and we might be able to benefit from it. Yeah, I actually also wanted to say, but uh, I forgot in this slide up here, when I was talking about uh, day of arrival and best before, even now with first in, first out, I don't know if they are using the information when it was harvested, because that could, even that could be something, because if something got really delayed, but it arrived almost at the same time, it should be, it should be sold first, because we can expect if the conditions were same in the transportation, that, that it should have less quality. But I don't know if they are doing that. So that would be just my speculation. But it could be a solution. So thank you very much, all of you, for contributing to these, uh, this discussion after Alex's uh, presentation. We will now move to the next presentation. And that will be uh, Digital Twins prediction of shelf life and keeping quality of fruit and vegetables. And this presentation is by Her uh, Martin Hertog from KU Leuven. And uh, Martin, he has a PhD in applied biological science from KU Leuven from 2004. Before that, he worked 12 years at the, uh, with post-harvest research, both in Holland and New Zealand and Belgium. And since 2009, he has been appointed research manager at KU Leuven in computational plant biology. I presume that's with computers um, they are focusing on. And his uh, research area is applied system biology, post-harvest physiology, kinetics modeling, and his, uh, his um, his uh, research is trying to bridge the gap between a fundamental plant science research and applied post-harvest technology. So uh, welcome to you, Martin. The floor is yours.
Thank you, uh, Mireta, for the uh, kind introduction. I assume my presentation is uh, visible. Yeah. Um, so I will go in a bit more detail on, uh, on the modeling behind uh, the digital uh, twins uh, and the way we plan to uh, implement them and make use of them in this uh, project. Um, as indicated already, this is a relatively small and uh, short uh, project. So we're not uh, reinventing the wheel, but we're actually trying to make proper use of whatever is already uh, out there. So as indicated, the challenge for the digital twin, whatever that may be, is actually to translate the storage conditions into remaining shelf life. Uh, currently, the existing uh, tracing traceability systems have in administrative information, but they don't have as much actual uh, product quality information. And they have all the information about source, about uh, maybe a collection date of your uh, product, had a harvesting date, whatever, uh, which grower produced it, but that's roughly about where it stops. So what we want to try in this DigiFresh project is actually enrich this information by providing um, additional info on product quality based on what the uh, sensor technology uh, has uh, bring, brought to us. So how does it look like um, in a digital twin is basically nothing more than some kind of a model that uses information from, in our case, uh, sensors that can track, can monitor the conditions throughout the logistic handling chain and combine that with information about the product that is being uh, transported. Um, it might be obvious that depending on the product, the model needs to be adjusted because a tomato will behave different from a lettuce hat or different from a potato or a strawberry. Um, but still, we want to keep the approach as generic as possible. So this will be taken as an input to a model that will then make predictions, make calculations on how the quality will change over time, depending the different conditions in the chain. And this will be, of course, temperature and humidity, but it could also include factors like gas conditions, uh, important, think about uh, transport uh, using CA containers, uh, the oxygen and CO2 levels, and even possibly the impact of ethylene on quality. The more you want to put in there, the more complex the digital twins become, uh, but that's a problem for, uh, for later, I would say. First, let's see whether we can even make small steps by implementing um, the most simple approach. So the idea is that subsequently, this model, this digital twin can be used to evaluate the performance of the chain. Where did it go wrong? But also towards the future, how might we be able to improve it? And taking into account the current planning, might what we have ahead of us be suitable for this particular batch of uh, fruit that we have um, in transport. So let's take one step back uh, because we talk about quality of the product. But what is quality? And this actually will show that potentially this could be a very complex issue because, well, think about yourself. You go to the shop, you buy some fruit and vegetables. How do you look at them? What do you regard as being quality? That can be about things you observe on the outside, eh? size, color, possible defects but also things that you only run into when you come at home and you start eating or cutting the product. Your fruit might be internally brown. Actually, they might develop a microbial rots the day after you bought them. The flavor might not be as you would have liked them. 
And then we don't even talk about possible nutritional or health value the product might have, and that might deteriorate over time. And think about making an advertisement with a vitamin C content or anti um, uh, oxygen um, values. Um, yeah, what if the vitamin C content changes over time? So quality of a product, depending on which product we're talking about, can depend on all these kind of quality attributes that, of course, needs to be measured objectively before you can uh, draw your conclusions. But of course, as a consumer, we have a certain background. Uh, we look at it uh, subjectively. We might like it or we might not like it, given the purpose of uh, why we buy uh, the product. If I want to buy some product for making some gems or marmalades, I might have different criteria as when I want to use that same product to put on top of uh, a tart I'm baking. So this brings me to old work has been done and some of the colleagues present, old colleagues I should say present here know about this, uh, done, work done in Wageningen by uh, Thijskens et al and uh, Mike Sloof, building up their philosophy about what quality is and how it is actually being out shaping up. So on one hand, you have the product that has certain properties which is affected by its environment. And now you have a consumer that needs to judge what the quality is. Is it good or is it bad? Well, of course, this judgment of the consumer depends on why am I buying it? Who am I? How much money do I have? What is the path? What season am I in? If I'm trying to buy some strawberries in the midst of winter, I might already quite quickly like them, while if there's lots of competition in summer, the same strawberry might not be acceptable to me anymore. So what I regard as being acceptable depends on all kind of influences I'm exposed to. But what is central to it is that I will be using certain criteria, certain threshold, and depending on the purpose, those limits of acceptance might change making the whole thing quite complex. But this is kind of how in your head, while you are in the supermarket, you form yourself a judgment of the quality of the product. So now we need to translate it into a model. We need to translate it into a, a digital twin. And yeah, typically you try to look for um, things that come back. You make abstractions of the problem, you simplify it, you look for patterns that come back, and eventually you develop an algorithm that is suitable for your purpose. And this model, well, that's the digital twin that we're going to use. Um, but what do we need there? Well, as a scientist from an academic point of view, I might want to make it as complex as possible to give an as realistic as possible representation of what's going on, which might work if I want to describe the softening of a fruit uh, by describing the activity of all kinds of enzymes, the breakdown of your cell wall polymers in there, but a consumer is not interested in this. So yes, this might be a perfect mechanistic very detailed model. Um, things are being published like that, have a very high scientific value, but are not applicable for the purpose we're looking at. So we try to limit ourselves to the essentials. Again, looking at what has been uh, is out there in the literature, uh, lots of valuable contributions have come from people um, that develop a more simplified approaches where we acknowledge that we can't put in all the details, but for the purpose of where we need it for, it is enough. So we limit ourselves to the essentials. Here, a model about color change of tomato developed by uh, Rob Schouten, uh, where in a very simplified approach, he describes chlorophyll breakdown uh, by some enzyme system. We don't try to identify exactly what enzyme it is about, but eventually the mechanism is complex enough to describe whatever we are interested in, in this case, 
the degreening of the tomato fruit and developing the lycopene from it here indicated by uh, DL. And then there is an expression to include the effect of temperature because the higher the temperature, the faster things will happen. But this already becomes a bit closer to what might be applicable to our case. Then digging further into history, actually we come back to the generic shelf life model developed by Taskins and, and further elaborated uh, on over the past years by other people, where he simply looked in, okay, what is the shelf life? How long does a product stay acceptable? mainly as a function of temperature. So his model was about, I have a certain temperature and given the temperature, I have a certain number of days that the product stays acceptable at some reference shelf life temperature. So this is a very simple model, which is extremely generic. And it has been shown to work for a whole bunch of fruits and vegetables where you can perfectly capture the effect of temperature on the shelf life of your product. But actually, if you think about it, for the current application, that's all we need. This is the, the basic part. Okay, we're not only interested in temperature, we would like to have some other factors in there, but just thinking in terms of acceptability, the overall keeping quality, forgetting about all the many possible underlying quality aspects that lead to this decision of saying, okay, it's acceptable or not. So this is actually the starting point for the project. Again, nothing fancy, but making use of knowledge that's out there to try to create in a short possible time, the biggest impacts we can get. So it's simple, it's generic, it implicitly combines multiple quality aspects into one judgment, taking into account the quality limits, but it becomes a bit diffuse because we can't say anymore whether a, pro a product became unacceptable because of firmness or because of rot or things like that, but it's in there. So originally the model was developed taking into account time and temperature, but over the years um, it has been extended also to include the effect of humidity and even the uh, metabolic rate of the product. So in response to uh, CA storage and or MA packaging, things alike. So we can actually extend this generic model to include humidity, oxygen and CO2 as well. And that's eventually the goal of what we want to do here in this project. So just an example, while Talking about rots of uh, strawberry, you might say, okay, spoilage goes up uh, over time as a function of temperature. There is a certain limit of acceptance. As soon as spoilage gets over that threshold level, the product is no longer acceptable. And this is, let's say, the detailed underlying model on this particular quality attribute, spoilage. But if you look at it from the point of keeping quality, uh, then the only thing we need to know is basically when does it go through this threshold? And that generic model is doing exactly that. And you can use that model approach to evaluate for a certain logistic chain. Let's assume here at harvest, the strawberry have about three and a half days of shelf life. Depending on how well our chain performs, actually we can bring them through the chain for over seven days before the product is really spoiled. Yeah. Another chain A is not as good. It's not that much optimized. And after two and a half days, three days, it is already uh, going to be spoiled. So in this way, you can use the model to actually see how well your uh, logistic conditions are performing and how much shelf life you might still have towards the future. It might sound a little bit funny in that after two days, for instance, if I look here, I went uh, for chain A, I went down from three and a half days to one and a half day. Well, actually that's quite correct. I lost two 
days, but in this chain, I only lost roughly about one day um, of shelf life, even though I spent already two days in my logistic chain. Why is that? Well, simply because the logistic chain is performing very well and is even performing better than what we would expect to see during a normal classical shelf life condition, which is good. So starting from this approach, we've implemented this for the, the Digifresh uh, project. And we did start from all the underlying uh, commodity uh, attributes. So actually there were lots of experiments done in Denmark where we focused on the impact of not only temperature, but also humidity. And we looked at the underlying quality attributes of gloss, sepal quality, spoilage, water loss, and firmness, which we regarded as being the most important quality attributes in the case of strawberry. Um, they set up different experiments over multiple weeks, testing a whole range of uh, temperature humidity scenarios. So we actually use loggers from Xsense to monitor those uh, conditions throughout the chain. We did manipulate them. We did not go for the most ideal chain. We did actually go for change where there is a temperature abuse, where the humidities might not always be as nice as you would hope for. But that gave us a rich data set to calibrate our models on. And that, for just some exemplary graphs, it looks like this, where over time, spoilage goes up, your weight loss goes up, mainly due to uh, the changes in humidity levels, and also the gloss of the fruit is uh, going down. So we actually started from the specific quality attribute models to um, fix these or calibrate these on the experimental data. We then designed some quality limits that we can discuss about, but we've chosen certain quality limits like 5% weight loss, uh, which seems to be uh, reasonable to us. And then we translated this data into the keeping quality. And we actually estimated the generic keeping quality on the output of the original multiple quality attributes, taking into account those different quality limits. So that approach was simplifying those five individual models by a single generic keeping quality model still allows us to explain 96% of the original data. And then we can use actually this model to say something about the overall uh, keeping quality of the product. If you think back what's underlying, uh, you might have your five different quality attributes. You start from an initial quality. You have designated a certain limit of acceptance. And then based on every single attribute, you can say, OK, with regard to weight loss, I only have less than a day of shelf life. While with regard to gloss, I have eight days of shelf life. But of course, we assume that in this case, mass will be the rate limiting attribute. In other words, the generic keeping quality model will just basically say, OK, you have 0.3 days of shelf life for this uh, given condition. So the generic model will take a humidity temperature profile as an input and will give you very straightforward output in terms of the keeping quality. In this particular example, when we assume for the shelf life a temperature of 12 degrees and the humidity of 95%, we can actually um, predict the keeping quality saying, okay, it starts at uh, three days, but already because of this very bad chain, because there was a period here at high temperature going to 25 uh, degrees, I rapidly start losing my keeping quality and actually within one and a half day, so that's somewhere around here, I've lost all my keeping quality. So we can still deduce it back to the underlying quality attributes, but actually that's no longer the aim. We now want to work with this very generic approach, talking about the overall keeping quality of the batch. 
there's two main challenges in here. So in principle, this approach can be quite easily implemented, but there's two main challenges and one I already touched upon, and that's about your quality limits. Think about that consumer that's buying some products and depending on his application, he might think, mm, okay, it's not good, but actually if I need to process it tonight, it doesn't matter and I will can just easily process it. So this consumer might have actually appreciate soft fruit, while another person somewhere in the supply chain, I mean, the, the end consumer might want to have a soft fruit, but actually someone halfway here might say, no, I need to have a, a rock firm fruit else I can't transport it uh, properly, um, leading us um, to, uh, for instance, firm strawberries that are rock firm, ideal for transport, but not necessarily ideal for consumption. So depending on who you are, what your role is in the chain, what your involvement is, you might want to put different criteria. So by putting those different criteria, of course, the shelf life will change drastically. Now, whether I put my weight loss criterion at 5% or at 8%, that, that all of a sudden will give me almost one day of extra shelf life. So of course, this is something that needs to be taken into account and needs to be decided in conjunction with the user of the application. So talking to Accents, their clients are not the consumers, of course. Their clients are transporters. These are retailers um, that want to make sure that they have proper products coming in so they have enough time to uh, sell it. So actually, you might need to put your limits in a different way. It doesn't affect the added value of the digital twins, it does only affect the way how you should, let's say, tune them, how you should calibrate them, and be aware that uh, this remaining days of shelf life is affected by the choice of those kind of parameters. So that's one challenge we have to go through. The other challenge we have to go through is about biological variation. Even though there exists books containing keeping quality data of all kinds of fruits and vegetables, it depends on what cultivar are we talking about? What is the season? Where did they come from? When were they harvested? And even so, within a batch of fruit, you will have individual variation from fruit to fruit. And this makes the whole thing a bit more tricky because the prediction might be done on an average um, batch, and that's still useful, but then it would be only useful to, let's say, um, judge the overall performance of the chain, but not necessarily to predict on the dot how many days of shelf life you have. Uh, just to give you an example, this is from old work on, on avocados, um, two batches exposed to the same conditions batch 37 out of the 50 we tested starts from a bit higher firmness and goes down much slower over time while another batch it um, was harvested at a lower firmness and went down much more rapidly and i am 100 percent sure there's many colleagues here in the audience that can uh, talk about similar stories they have uh, dealt with so how can we deal with it a couple of solutions that we see and that we want to address in the uh, second part of the project as we will be going for an extension uh, for next year as well. Uh, it can be about trying to um, characterize the quality when you put your batch into uh, the system. Of course, that requires input from growers or whoever is collecting uh, your materials. Another alternative could be to do some accelerated shelf life testing because the initial quality characterization will only define the starting quality, but might not necessarily define the rate at which quality decays. And sometimes we see that, for instance, cultivar differences might be related to the rate of decay or even one year, the rate might be faster than some other year. 
So accelerated shelf life testing can be a help to quickly establish those rates for the particular batch in the study. Another approach would be trying to develop biomarkers, which has been done also in different research groups, coming up with either gene expression, proteins or volatiles, trying to characterize uh, the batch. But again, that will require much more input, let's say, uh, when you introduce a batch of product into the, the chain. And then we still need to include this uncertainty in the modeling. What you need to consider here, is it worthwhile the effort? Uh, so is the product value big enough? What is the throughput time? If it's only five days of a logistic chain, it might not be worthwhile to do accelerated shelf life testing. What is the volume? Uh, so what is at stake in case something gets lost? Um, so these are things that we need to consider with the industry to see how to tackle um, these possible uh, options. So currently using the input from loggers, we can work uh, with the kind of expected average behavior of a typical batch to um, judge the performance of a chain. But if we can include some uncertainty in there, we can make it explicitly visible that this is only a kind of an estimate, but your particular batch might be a bit out of it, unless we can indeed come up with a proper characterization of every batch over and over again. So these are two of the main challenges I, uh, I can foresee. Um, so what we're currently working on uh, and what we will continue after the break is uh, combining those digital twins with a sensor platform. We've chosen for XSense because they already have a very good infrastructure in place. So we don't need to set up a whole track and tracing system, but we can start from an existing platform and we can just add some extra um, yeah, knowledge to the system to make the sensor platform a real smart sensor platform. So by including these kind of digital twins, we can actually exploit some of the expertise that has been out there in research for over 30 years, um, helping us not only to see ah, temperature is changing, but what is the impact of those changing temperatures and to really interpret those changes in temperature and humidity in terms of what is the quality uh, doing. So again, discussion point, be careful whether we can ever reach an exact prediction or we should more focus on a performance ranking of the different chains, but that's something uh, for the near future, I would say. And with that, I've come to the end of what I wanted to share with you for this afternoon. Thank you very much, Martin, for a nice um, presentation on modeling. Uh, there is uh, one question, and uh, actually two. It's from Ellie. Okay, I got here. Mm -hmm. I just need to go back to the chat. Yep. So it's from Ellie. He's asking: even in extremely generic models, small changes in initial quality used as input in the model, for example, initial spoilage, which cannot be set to zero for initial time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you agree on that. Yep. We'll make big changes in the shelf life estimation in different conditions. Which solutions are suggested so far to overcome this uncertainty? I know yep. you talked about uncertainty, but... So that's basically what I uh, added in those last final few slides, Sam. The options there are we have to look or for instance at specific uh, problems i mean there are sorting machines that can pick up for all the quality attributes already quite some detail but specifically for spoilage that can be an issue so yes uh, we've seen in the past comparing large number of batches specifically with regard to spoilage that one season there is more infection than another season one grower might be prone to uh, more intensive infection and the positive thing is the 
structure of the digital twin can deal with it. And everything can indeed be related back to the initial level of spore loading present. But I agree, the problem is, how can you then quantify this to use as an input to this particular system? And um, as long as we don't have that solution, that's why I would say um, focus on using this approach to benchmark your logistic chain. So don't blind focus on the exact value, but even when we consider an arbitrary infection level, yeah, which might not be correct, but let's assume an arbitrary infection level, if you transport your, your product through 10 different chains to the end market, they will behave differently. And some batches or some logistic change will result in more intensive spoilage than other logistic chains. And regardless the initial level of spoilage, that comparison of the logistic chain will uh, be very similar. So you can still do it, uh, apply the approach for benchmarking, but indeed don't fixate yourself on the exact predicted value because that might be affected by these levels. And the only other way would then do something like accelerated shelf life testing. So we do that, for instance, for Apple storage, we set aside batches of apples and see whether they are more prone to browning than others. But of course we can do it because we store them for half a year, but for strawberries that only have a total chain of a few days, that's not going to, uh, to work. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. We still have a few more questions. I sh suggest that we uh, bring those uh, later today because um, we will, um, we, we are going to have a break now and uh, we have a coffee break or break until uh, two o'clock. So um, please uh, be back um, at two o'clock and we will continue this workshop. So we can save the questions for the discussion later. Yes, I think we, yeah. Yeah, we will save the questions because I mean, it would be nice to have time to, to discuss and we have a discussion section. So we will save the questions for, for, for after the presentation from Accent. So uh, welcome back uh, after the break at two o'clock.
and welcome back. From the coffee break. I can still see we have many with us in the workshop. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. So uh, we will like to continue with the second part of this workshop. It's about the, first of all, the DigiFresh solution. And then 2.30, we will move to networking and discussion. And I can see that Martin, he answered one of the questions, but let's uh, come back to the questions and have further discussion at uh, 2.30, where Bioso, Angela and Manu will come on. We'll lead that. So uh, I would like to introduce you Ham Bar from Accents, And Ham is going to have the next presentation on DigiFresh solution. And uh, it's about ex existing Xsense solution and the DigiFresh potential. And Ham, he has a Bachelor of Science in, in Computer Science from York University. And then he has been employed first five years at Spiro Solutions uh, as project manager, working with acquisition systems in the internet field. After that followed a five year um, employment in micro gaming, a company developing, um, I presume games for the internet uh, situated in South Africa. After that, he moved uh, to Israel and became head of uh, a product manager for four years at markets.com. Um, building marketing supporting tools. And then since September 2019, he has been employed as project manager as, at Accents, uh, responsible for web and mobile analytics uh, for improving acquisition, conversion, and retention, and also marketing automation, um, automation in implementation. So, about two and a half years at Accent. So uh, I want to hand over the floor to you, Ham, uh, for your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, actually, uh, most of my experience, uh, I'm not coming from uh, this industry of uh, food. I was more uh, in the software of uh, gaming uh, solutions, which has nothing to do with it. Um, you, you can hear me, yes? Yes, we can. Ah, okay. Yes. Yes. I wondered, uh, I'm usually using Teams uh, for Microsoft, not the uh, Zoom, so I'm uh, less uh, familiar with this. Zoom. Um, Accense, uh, I will uh, uh, show and the presentation that we have about uh, Accense and the connection with this uh, project that we are doing now with uh, DigiFresh. Um, at this point, uh, we have just uh, received the uh, module and um, and we are uh, integrating it into the system so we can uh, um, 
uh, verify and see in real life how the um, uh, model is working. And uh, so, uh, along the sides here, I will show you exactly what uh, where it will be fitted. So um, we are spread uh, widely in the world. Uh, you can see here on the map. So um, each uh, dot here on the map uh, represents a site that we have an FM uh, facility monitoring uh, station there. Uh, monitoring their uh, facility. And some of the dots here are uh, gateways on the way of a shipment. So if a shipment begins here in Canada and ends here in New Zealand, so on the way, uh, depends which type of sensor we are using. So on the way, it will uh, meet uh, one of our uh, gateways and we load the data into the cloud. So then the customer can uh, uh, monitor and be alerted for uh, thresholds that he will be defining. Uh, some of our customers, you can see just their logos. And uh, this is what we are actually doing. We are uh, monitoring along the cold chain. So from, uh, from the moment that uh, someone will put a logger, or that's a logger on the uh, pallet or whatever is monitoring, we will be monitoring it. So we can put it uh, immediately after its harvest uh, in transit and the distribution centers uh, until the supermarket, until the receiver received it. Uh, mainly what uh, is done, so the receiver receives the goods and sees the report. And according to uh, his uh, expectations and his uh, limits, he will uh, decide maybe not to receive the goods according to the results. So here, uh, for example, uh, we can fit in uh, one more score, like uh, we have currently a couple of uh, uh, monitor the scores. So a score of uh, uh, losing quality along the shipment will be fitted here so the customer can understand how much uh, quality was uh, lost. Also the predicted uh, shelf life, uh, which we are, uh, as uh, Martin said before, could be that it's not uh, the actual uh, measure that he wants to know because it's not exactly two days, but he sees that uh, comparing it with uh, different uh, shipments, he sees that this uh, shipper is uh, much uh, uh, preserving the quality better. Uh, our loggers are uh, sending the data. My boss is looking for me. Maybe he wants to join the meeting and he cannot. Um, currently, the a sensor is uh, sending the data to the cloud with a gateway or with a, a directly real-time sensors that are sending the, transmitting the data to the cloud. And we have also integrated uh, using API with uh, various uh, platforms. Um, uh, that's it about that. Um, uh, we are also uh, doing some uh, research, and research and development. So uh, this is one of the examples that we are now doing the joint venture with, with uh, Digifresh. So many academic collaboration and partnerships conducting primary research into new sensors for detecting gases and volatile organic compounds and continuous investment in the cloud. Um, 
Now we have two parts of the accent uh, system. Um, uh, it's the hardware and the cloud. Uh, hardware are the sensors that we are using and the gateway you can see here on the right side and the cloud. Speaking about hardware, uh, we have a couple of types of uh, sensors. We have a uh, RF uh, sensor. We have also real-time uh, cellular sensor. And this is the uh, gateway that will uh, receive the data from that uh, RF sensor and will uh, load it to the get, uh, cloud. Uh, cellular real-time loggers directly to the cloud and USB data loggers uh, we have also. So uh, we are trying to use uh, all types of uh, requirements and also it depends on the uh, cost that the uh, customer is willing to invest. The USB ones are uh, much cheaper than the real-time. And this is a picture for you to understand better. This is the real time log. This is the RF logger and the gateway. We have a couple of sensors inside those loggers. So the main ones is the temperature and the humidity and the a location for the real time sensors that have a location. Um, the light, uh, well, uh, mild, the light and shock uh, sensors also, but not so uh, widely spread. Those are uh, more uh, technical details of each uh, logger that we have. I will not uh, go deep here. If you have questions or you can just, uh, if someone is interested, they can go into our uh, website and uh, download the data sheets for the real time and for the RF, which are the main ones that we are uh, selling. Uh, the cloud. The cloud, uh, uh, this slide uh, speaks about the metrics, which is a uh, tight uh, to this uh, DigiFresh uh, project that we are doing. So as we have um, temperature that we will, def this is the simplest uh, temperature and RH uh, which we uh, display and we can set alerts of uh, breaches, uh, et cetera. And dew point, degree hours we calculate, we calculate cold chain logistic score and the pallet at risk according to user settings, you can set a pallet at risk a, a definition and mean kinetic temperature. And at this point, we can, we will add the shelf time and the quality a losing a score inside the, this uh, section. Uh, here are a bit of uh, pictures that uh, for the system, this you can see the shipment, you can see uh, the temperature and the uh, relative humidity. Um, and uh, above that, we can also add the graph, the chart of the quality losing uh, of this uh, specific product. Uh, we can represent the data in a couple of ways. Here in a dashboard, we have uh, the uh, charts and the tables that we can uh, add the widget of the and remaining life, uh, uh, shelf life of a product. If someone wants to monitor it uh, on a dashboard. Um, we, uh, we have an option to view stuff on the mobile uh, application. So you can uh, 
do the same whatever we do on the desktop application and display it for the customer so we can do it here also with uh, push notifications so you can get alerts and notification about the arrival of those goods. Uh, instant alert sent to mobile email SMS configured by the user. Uh, we have uh, another tool which is uh, an analytics tool which you also uh, don't know if you can see a couple of uh, measurements that we have uh, like the average temperature minimum temperature so here uh, we will uh, be able to display also the remaining lifetime and the quality losing uh, uh, measurements Uh, so as you can see, we have a couple of um, ways to output uh, this model. And uh, the software will uh, need at the first uh, step is to use the model, uh, model and to calculate uh, uh, the measures that we are speaking about. Um, Xsense has a couple of models. We have the facility monitoring, which I spoke before. So if you have a, a place that you want to monitor, and uh, we are speaking now more about uh, this uh, project about shipment. So uh, the shipment uh, model uh, can uh, monitor the shipment along the uh, route and uh, to do some risk assessment automation with degree hours mkt ccl so he also fit uh, the remaining lifetime and this is how it looks and this is the end of the presentation Um, if you have any questions, this is uh, you can raise it now. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hain. Uh, yet there are small questions in the chat. So I was wondering, uh, these lockers, if you are going to measure gases, would that be an option, for example, respiration gases, gases that are related to respiration rate, would that be an option? This is uh, in the future, in the near future, when we have uh, in place the sensors for that. Currently, we, we have only the temperature and the relative humidity. Coming soon, the, the CO2 and then the ethylene that will uh, answer this question. Mm. So, so that's an area you're you're actually interested in and working on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any questions to him? To him? We have time. I, may I do it by speaking instead of yes. typing in the chat. <laughs> yes, that's perfectly fine. Speaking is a lot faster. Yes. Uh, one of the things uh, we will struggle with is that this XSense sensor is in one position in a container in a storage facility wherever, but it's just one sensor. But there are, of course, spatial gradients in that space. Are you somehow going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with it? I'm not sure that I understand you. you what I mean is that, for example, let's talk, take a reefer container. Uh, your sensor is in the front at the coldest spot and all the time measures zero degrees C. You can then predict quality of a fruit which is in that position. But in the meantime, we know that some other fruit are at the other end of the container and they are three degrees C warmer. Are you somehow going to do kind of a prediction for what will happen to that fruit as well? 
Um, I'm not sure that I have the answer for that. Maybe Martin, uh, you have the answer for the yeah, prediction model. Don't mind me stepping in there. Yes. Um, indeed, the loggers as such are not limited. Huh? So um, they can be assigned to a palette, for instance. Um, and then you have indeed already the information at the palette uh, based. Because as you correctly uh, indicate, Lucas, uh, there are huge um, differences within a, in a container that can go up to six degrees, uh, depending on the position where you are. So yes, it needs to be taken into account. So it really depends on how much the user wants to invest in it and how dense of um, uh, you know, logging they want to, uh, to implement. So if you, in, in the, if worse comes to worse, and we have been talking about it, but it hasn't resulted in a clear plans yet, but theoretically what you could do, if you know that um, you're talking about a container, you could, of course, um, when you do your uh, modeling and you know, okay, this logger is representing basically a, a whole container, that you can put some uh, margin, some uncertainty on your predictions. So either we do it based on data, depending on how many loggers we have, or we could include uh, some margins based on some expected variation. But it would definitely be not a plan to implement, for instance, full swing CFD models to describe the humidity distribution in a container. We can do that, we can make those models, but wouldn't it be very practical um, to implement because you need the exact dimension, you need the exact stacking pattern of boxes, of pallets, etc. cetera. Um, so that's simply impossible. Uh, there has been an EU project, I think, uh, together with Germany, where they looked at smart containers and about uh, loggers that would communicate within the container with a central unit. Um, so they would put different loggers at different positions and that would go to the, the central units that would then communicate um, uh, this information. Um, so currently through Accent, we don't have access to a system like that, but that's also the um, way it could go but definitely a challenge again. Thank you very much. Other questions for, for Han? Hain? Yeah. Okay, I think it could come up uh, later, Hain, so so let's see if uh, there are questions when we come to the next part. I would like to follow up a little bit uh, uh, on questions from before the break. And uh, one of the question was about um, how to measure non-destructive uh, initial spoilage, if there are any measurements uh, available. And Martin, you, you commented on that and one one measurement could be volatile organic compounds if the spoiled fruits are uh, in, emitting volatiles uh, because that doesn't um, include handling of the produce, but it is a, a very complex technology still um, because often volatiles are found in very low concentrations. And I can also see that you suggested in, in IR or hyperspectral imaging, but again, that's about handling of the produce. So uh, I think we we are still busy the next uh, hundred years with post harvest storage technology to uh, <laughs> minimize waste through <laughs> food waste in the supply chain. Uh, I want to if I want to address uh, then uh, there was this question from Ali. Jalali, um, about is it possible to extend the modeling to pre-harvest stage in this case? 
for example, could be a connection with temperature humidity profile in growing stage with spoilage at harvest time. That was a question to you, Martin. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it is actually a nice approach to work around, let's say, complex um, technical measurements but heavily relying on then the expertise of these experts um, like we are doing now anyway uh, quite often uh, a grower will have a gut feel about the behavior of his uh, product so yeah why not that could be a, a first starting point if there is nothing else so to say <laughs> but of course one of the things i maybe didn't emphasize enough, but you should be aware of is that you want to make things uh, a bit objective. And the question is whether the um, you need to have an expert that can be objective and is not uh, too much subjective in his approach. So you would still at least work with independent people that can, based on their expertise, can judge the stat and quality of this uh, patch. Yeah. And that brings me to the next question. It's from Matinja uh, Fall, correct, from uh, Holland. Um, writing, uh, what do you think about incorporation of expert knowledge or allowing for such expert input in the digital twins for initial quality estimates? Yeah, sorry, I had that question in mind while giving my answer indeed. Um, <laughs> so, I think it, it, it can be a, an, an added value eh? because um, we can try to, to make it objective. So that requires then by preference, let's say instrumental methods that don't lie. Um, but of course it becomes, it makes it more complex. Eh? You, you need to collect those measurements and you need to uh, input this initial quality into the system again. If these are, for instance, shipments going from New Zealand to Europe that uh, spent uh, a full month uh, on the sea, that's worthwhile investing in it. If we're talking about a batch that is harvested, sold tomorrow and eaten the day after, of course, that's not worthwhile going through the, um, the effort. So mm -hmm. I think we should uh, definitely design that uh, product by product. Okay. Yeah. Then we have uh, another question here. Um, yeah, it's from Leo Lucas. Uh, he is writing today. I heard quite a lot about incorporating things like fruit characteristic, initial quality, and pre harvest information in our post harvest quality prediction models. It's nice thoughts, but are there actually good examples available of people who did that successfully? Thanks, Leo. <laughs> you, you know uh, probably as much as I uh, do. Um, there has been, uh, has been efforts at least. Uh, also in Wageningen, um, forgot the name of the spin-off that has gone into genetic uh, characterization of, um, for instance, fruit at harvest to say something about a storage potential. Um, not sure what their current status is. Do they still exist? I doubt that. <laughs> okay. Um, in my years in Wageningen, um, we spent some time, which I really liked, with um, a potato warehouse company that included model predictive control in their warehouse computer. And they provided the service, uh, Tolsma technique, they provided the service to the clients to uh, do a cell rate shelf life testing. And they've done that for two years or so. I don't know why they stopped with it. Um, so I can't answer that, but there has been uh, efforts, uh, but that's also why I don't want to pinpoint ourselves on exact um, predictions, but I want to emphasize also the value of this approach in terms of benchmarking your logistic chain. 
So it's you use the approach more to say something about the performance quality of the logistic chain than really selling this as an end um, quality with some guarantee to your client. And that's something we need to make extremely clear to everyone that, that's involved. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I want to be indeed realistic and open in that. Um, but apparently also uh, at your place, there is enough potential that you are working on a project. So you're running into exactly the same issues. <laughs> yes, we are. And I mean, of course, coming back specifically to my question, um, it makes so much sense to me. Include that pre-harvest information. In my view, the biggest problem is, okay, I have some pre-harvest information, how to translate that to which parameter in the models from Martin? Like I spoke to a red, a guy storing red currents uh, the other day. He mentioned uh, last summer in the Netherlands was chilly and rainy. Then I know up front the red currents which are in my storage facility this year. Well, they will be a bit more susceptibility susceptible to dehydration because the red currents haven't practiced to protect themselves against dehydration in the pre-harvest stage. Sounds to me like a fantastic, reasonable, plausible story. I would now like to run to your model, Martin, and adjust parameter X. Well, a little bit. And what is that? A little bit. But I think the challenge is which parameter and how much should we adjust it? No, no. So over the years, we've done let, let's forget about up to the level of really practical implementation, but the issue you address, um, there has been several efforts, um, both in Wageningen and from our side, to do this. Eh? So um, there is, coming back to the, uh, the avocados, we have a corporation in, uh, in Chile, and where they have been collecting large number of batches, we've developed those models, and then we um, are linking proteomics, metabolomics. Uh, we haven't done genomics here in this particular project um, to those model parameters. And we're indeed exploring it. And we're searching for so those bioindicators, so to say, biomarkers that can link to some of our um, model parameters. Um, with varying levels of success. So there is no general recipe that will work forever. Although some things are more easy than others. If you think about weight loss, which commercially is a very important uh, issue, there has been work done where you simply measure uh, permeance of the peel to water loss. And that gives you a perfect um, prediction for the the mass loss because it's straightforward, straightforward physical process. So mm -hmm. there, a kind of accelerated shelf life testing, just do a, a, a weight loss test under extreme conditions will give you a value mm -hmm. for the permeability value of the of the fruit, which you can immediately plug into those uh, weight loss models, and they work perfectly fine. But that's a very simple um, process that is very well understood. And when you get into more of the, the complex processes, like in the rod development, uh, firmness loss, uh, that's not one to one that easy to link it to uh, some of those um, yeah, metabolic or, or other kind of measurements. Absolutely so, true. So thank you very much, Martin. I think there's uh, plenty of things still to discuss, and I can see there's a com a comment from Ernst Wolverine from uh, Netherlands, um, and he is suggesting that we need more physiological metabolic, metabolite uh, gene expression data of what exactly determines the initial quality. And, and that could be a way forward as well. So I think we need to put competences together and continue working and not giving up and making things more smart because the reason for the high waste is actually because it's not it quality is changing without us noticing it it suddenly is there and then it's maybe too late 
I want to address the last question and then we'll move on to the last part, which is networking and discussion. And uh, there's one question from Rainer Jedermann from uh, University of Bremen asking, we discussed remote monitoring and shelf life modeling since a couple of years. Are digital twins just a new term or is there a specific new technology behind it? Who wants to answer that question? Hein or Martin or Alex? It's, it's just, um, an, uh, how do you say that? Uh, a mode term? In, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a fashion term. A fashion term, yeah. Well, yeah, but not, not if you talk about uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, it's also fashion, it's not a way of statistics. It's from that point of view, it's not, not anything new. Uh, so you, in that way, you're still looking for uh, you know, learning a system, training it on, on the results. But whether you call it a neural network model or a, a digital twin, that's all, uh, in the end, it's all the, the same. But it's indeed a, a fashion term that has been popping up over the past few years. Um, but you might as well call it a, a model, whether it's a statistical model or a neural network model or a kinetic model. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this nice discussion. I think we'll move to the next point, which is networking and discussion by Angela Mano from APSO. And uh, Angela, she has a Master of Science in Chemistry and also Food Technology from Southern Spain. And she has been project manager as, uh, at Biosul since 2015, and where she is managing and participating in research and development projects, and also director of communication and marketing at Biosul. And uh, she is uh, responsible for communication and several EU projects. So uh, Angela. Hello everyone. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Merete. We have another question from Ali Jalali, but maybe we can, because what well, we have been a discussion right now is just now I'm going just to share just a little bit uh, opening an icebreaker question, but I think that the discussion is already very interesting. Uh, if you allowed me to give this new question to know who is attending today to the workshop and uh, we can continue with your question Ali. Let me share my screen. Uh, Angela, yeah. what about we we discussed that everyone should put on their camera. So yes, yes. A, this a photo. Exactly. Uh, is is it time now or do you want first to address your network uh, questions for the networking section? Yeah, maybe we can do it now just to because then you have to yeah, stop I'm sharing. going to stop sharing. And uh, well, uh, let let us see who are there and who continue uh, uh, connected with us. We are yes. trying to to have a nice uh, picture of the audience that we have today. Thank you for joining us. Okay, some cameras are switching right now. Great. Okay. Let me make the picture. Okay, thank you. Another one. Right. So, uh, let me share my screen. Well, I have prepared a presentation uh, just to know who, who are there. And I use a Slido. Uh, so please, if you have your mobile phone or if you want to make in another uh, screen of your of your computer, the code is 962466. Here you have the QR code. There are very, very easy questions. 
Okay, just a fast quiz of two questions. Here we have the consortia, Alex, David, Martin. Julia, just write the name or even a dot if you want to be anonymous. Okay. Thank you very much. you have any problem to connect just let me know i think that's more or less okay so here we are what proportion of global food production is weighted what do you think the middle of the production one third or a fourth Easy. Okay. Check it. Okay, very nice. It's one third of the production. Yes, I think that this amazing. It's not the half, but one third is uh, too much concerning the how much it costs and uh, the resource that we, we have spent for this uh, wasted food. And the second, how much is the annual value of this food waste? One trillion, one billion, one million dollars. What do you think? Easy again. Let's see, one trillion to go to the maximum. Let's check it. Yes, it is one trillion of dollars just in food waste. So uh, we have a very, very big margin to go to save in. Rene, congratulations. This, you are the quicker and the, uh, on both of our questions. Okay, so just uh, I think that this uh, topic is uh, something that concerns everyone. It's a very, very important uh, topic for technology, innovation, and even uh, to improve uh, our system. And now, just where are you from? I think that today we don't have a lot of uh, thousand representation from thousand countries. We have Belgium, Germany, Denmark, Sweden. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And more or less, if uh, the idea is now, if we have mostly R&D sector here or industry, uh, maybe we have something related to public sector, communication and marketing, another. And this is the winner, I think. Yeah, well. The idea of our project, and even uh, we have a new proposal for the next year for a continuation of our project, uh, we would like also reach to the industry uh, because we think that this is a very useful tool to use in, in the industry uh, for distributor, for retailer. Okay, uh, what is your role within the food supply chain? Uh, or if you are involved with producers, with retailer, with processors, or just as consumer. Just maybe to know uh, your point of view in for for this tool and for 
for possible uh, achievement in our work. Okay, for working sensors, research in general, consumers. I think that maybe also research at consumer in both sides, we can make our refrigeration more nice. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was just a nice, a cute, a quick overview of all of you. So if you want, we can continue with the discussion. I'm going to, Merito and me, we can do it together. Uh, let's talk, uh, let's know uh, the last question that we don't uh, answer. Uh, Ali Jalali will ask, uh, what about the interaction between different quality parameters? For example, could be a connection between spoilage development and mass loss? What do you think, Merete or Alex? Martin? Well, um, from, uh, let's say, the point of view of how we how it is included in the in the modeling is that they are considered to be um, kind of parallel independent attributes. I'm not saying that physiologically they cannot affect each other and they, they, they will be interlinked at some stages because with fruit softening they're more prone to, to rots. But I mean from a consumer point of view uh, in the whole approach it is assumed that um, you cannot bargain between them. So you can't say I have a little bit of rot but I have uh, a nice uh, color so that's why I accept a little bit of rot. The way it works in the uh, original uh, quality model is that these are considered to be uh, non-communicating uh, independent uh, quality attributes. So if any of them goes through its threshold, then the product will be uh, discarded. So that's at least the approach that is in the physiology and the, the, the philosophy behind the, uh, the model. You can, of course, discuss, but it's always uh, the case. Um, but I think that we are more eager to, let's say, change limits because of the purpose of why we buy product than that we would, for instance, um, yeah, change a limit for one because of the, the quality we get at another uh, with regard to another quality attribute. But that's something that maybe the other researchers, because well, we were aiming for industry in this uh, project, but hearing there is uh, almost 80% of researchers here, they might have their own uh, experience and, and feeling about this. So what is your idea on this? Anyone want to contribute to that? Maybe if it, I think it's always which uh, product we're talking about. Yeah, and like if we take bananas and yeah. then they ripen, their accessibility to microbial attack increases. Yes, yeah, so we might be talking about interaction. Yeah, but I'm... I would still say it's either rotten or it's either overripe and that will kind of be the determining for consumer regarding the quality yeah. so to, to emphasize from the physiological point of view we do acknowledge that they might be linked together it's only from the consumer point of view that we keep the appreciation independent so if one of the attributes leads to a disqualification, then the product is no longer accepted. Yeah, and also remember the thresholds. You know, uh, when we do research, 
uh, we, we can see interactions at higher levels. Uh, but here we're talking about really low thresholds. As you saw for weight loss, a 5% uh, and for rot, for instance, it's 5 persons. That's almost nothing compared to when we do it in research. Yeah, and we can go up to, or often it goes to 100% spoilage. Yeah, and then that data is used. And uh, we might see those interactions later on when it's actually already not acceptable, so. Okay, I just want to take the voice now because we are soon gonna finish this workshop. And I would like you, uh, I would like to hear how you see the potential for a uh, Diggy Fresh um, solution. Anyone wants to comment on that? Can you be a bit more specific, Marita? Yes, I mean, how could it work in the, could anyone from the supply chain see a potential in, in using um, a sensor that can trace the temperature and relative humidity in order to uh, determine uh, um, remaining shelf life at arrival? Do we still have anyone from industry here working with the supply chain? Maybe I can add something. Um, I'm Inge During from Sandstech. I'm also a freelance uh, innovation manager at Flanders Food which is uh, competition, com uh, yes, uh, representing the Flemish food industry. I do think that um, food companies and retail companies could be interested in such devices. I, I think there's a uh, lot of going on on sustainability and more and more food companies are aware that they have to do something about uh, food loss. So I do think that there is a lot of interest in such uh, devices and in the whole, um, yes, in the whole project as uh, you presented it, because I didn't know it uh, until now. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I can also say that uh, we will finish February next year. And actually we have planned a uh, transport from Southern Europe to Northern Europe for January where we will do a monitor of the temperature and relative humidity along the supply chain for strawberries and uh, Romani letters in order to try and uh, validate uh, our models and uh, our sensor technology and to see how, how well it works. So that's, that's the last step of the project. Uh, and hopefully we can go into continuation where we, we, we hope to work on uh, more in details about the uh, strawberries and uh, Romani letters and also go into transport of bananas. Uh, that is the plan for continuation for 2022. Uh, yes, any more questions, comments to the workshop today? Yes. Ask for, for the attendees that if they could fill out our satisfaction survey, it will be very nice from, from them. You can find the link in our chat. Uh, well, thank you again. I just wanted to add something. I didn't want to interrupt Martin. And uh, going back to discussion about success and uh, why we still don't have digital twins and actually, uh, I think one of the reasons is also the uh, availability of the hardware, affordable hardware, because we know like we are using some sensors in the lab that cost uh, the sensor itself and the data logger costs like around 300 euro. And that's too expensive to be used in the supply chain. Again, depends, of course, if, the, if it's like a load of avocados, maybe you can afford to put there an expensive sensor. But uh, in general, it's too expensive. So uh, the reason also why 
um, accents actually fitted very well into our consortium was that they're providing this relatively cheap, affordable uh, sensor tags that uh, do already communicate um, with the cloud. So there is all the hardware. So yeah, and Mer Martin already mentioned this, that we did not have to start from the beginning. So there could be a success here because we already like we, we we moved to the next step but of course i don't i cannot say anything about other attempts and what went wrong there comments on that So are we sort of closing the workshop? Are there any more questions, comments? I have a question. Do you still, uh, are you still looking for companies to explore the devices or is it already scheduled? What companies are retail companies or food companies are going to, to test them? I think it's high. I think that we first need to implement it to finish the implementation. I assume it will be in a month or two, or maybe less. And then our, uh, we will uh, do like a pilot on our customers. So if, uh, mm -hmm. if you will be our customer, we'll be happy to pilot it. I guess Inge, your question is whether there's still space to include anyone in the, in the project. Yes, or maybe there are still companies who don't who don't know the devices and are still uh, will be happy to participate in in the project or to explore the devices in some kind of case study. Um, so I was wondering if you still need some companies to uh, to do uh, such the rest of the study. Yeah. So, I mean, currently for what we have in mind, and it's, it's kind of a closed consortium, um, but indeed, if we find some space um, for doing further validation studies, we might be looking for volunteers there uh, to help out. Okay. Just just know that Flanders Food can, yeah. can look for partners if you still are looking for, for them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any more comments? Okay. So I want to close the workshop. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you for participating and making this afternoon very interesting and uh, uh, getting inputs to our DigiFresh project and I can also say that we will forward the presentations to the participants and that you uh, can find more information about the project on the EIT food homepage and then if you could please uh, go in uh, uh, click on the link and um, and fill out uh, the survey about satisfaction for this workshop we will be very, very happy. You can see it in the chat. So uh, thank you all for participating. And uh, we hope by the end of next year that we can tell you more about uh, DigiFresh if we get a continuation uh, in EIT food of this project. So thank you for today and goodbye. Yeah, thanks very much for the good overview. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you all.